Welcome, welcome, everyone. We're so glad to be here and so glad to be able to do this. So we're excited about this evening. I'm here, and Mary? Hello, everyone. Good to be with you again. We're going to begin tonight by just reviewing where we've been and then moving on into continuing discussion of the co-creative partnership. Reviewing week one, we talked about the Sacred Heart Contract, a Sacred Heart Contract or a request, however you understand that, is based on your desire alone. Composing a contract or making a request can lead to attracting and manifesting what you want in your life, spiritual growth, establishing a co-creative partnership, opening your heart more fully, and then we talked about the six-step process, including communicating and working with your co-creative partner. So that was week one. We're going to underline here that contract, that Sacred Heart contract, is all about you. It really is your gift into the universe, into the process. So last week, we talked about the co-creative partner, which I consider such an important part of the Sacred Heart contract and the manifestation process. Co-creative manifestation is not necessarily a magical process. Although some things can appear with just a request from you, the program is so much richer when you are involved. This gives you options. It also increases your chances for success. Plus, spiritual growth becomes possible. This co-creative process is a lifelong skill that you can use in almost any situation. We also talked about flow last week, and flow is like manifestation weather. It's like when to move forward and when to wait. And the way you understand manifestation weather or flow is by connecting to your co-creative partner and beginning a two-way communication process. So we started talking about communication last week when we talked about the senses and how the senses can be involved in the process of two-way communication. We're going to talk about the co-creative partnership more in depth. We're going to talk about what the goals are in regards to the co-creative partnership. And we're also going to talk about all the elements that are necessary for manifestation. It's a little bit more complicated than what we presented last week. There's another element that we want to add in, which is about taking action, and we'll present that to you. So we're going to go more deeply into the communication process, and we're also going to talk about some of our experiences and some of our feelings in regards to the communication process, times when we were trusting, when we were acting appropriately, times when we were resistant, but also experiences that occurred in many different ways to sensitize you to all the ways that communication can take place. And once communication is understood, then it might be a time for appropriate action. So we're going to talk about actions that you can take. And then finally, we'll talk about what an impending manifestation can feel like. It might feel like ease or it might feel somewhat overwhelming at times. So we'll talk a bit about that too. So the goals of your co-creative partnership are to establish two-way communication with your co-creative partner. Co-creative partner is a being, an energy, however you might understand that in the invisible realms, a spiritual being most likely, that you can have a personal relationship with, a co-creative partnership. For some people it will be God. For other people, it may be an angel or maybe a spiritual principle of, that you see as an energetic form. That's your own personal process. You want to establish a two-way communication with your co-creative partner. Learn to recognize signs, signals, 
dreams, etc., as forms of communication. Ascertain the meaning of the communication that you receive. Jointly practice the art of manifestation through attraction and receptivity. And again, take the appropriate action as needed. Take the steps that will bring about the actual manifestation. Last week, we talked about how important communication is with your co-creative partner and guiding you through the process of attracting and also manifesting. The thing is, is that although we can talk about generalities about the elements that go into this process of manifestation through attraction, it really is kind of a maze. And you need guidance from a higher intelligence as you go through it. It makes the process so much easier. Manifestation can look different from one person to the next and also from one event to the next. And so it is somewhat free form. And that's why you have the co-creative partner to help you through the process, to point out when to move ahead, when to slow down, when to wait, when to turn left, when to turn right. The co-creative partner is a very important part of the manifestation process. So there are four necessary elements for manifestation. The first is desire. What you want is the fuel for attraction and the manifestation process. So we're always asking ourselves, what do I want? You know, what do I want? But it should be tempered by openness to receiving in ways other than what is expected. Allow for divine upgrades, adjustments, and substitutions. Desire equals attraction. Openness, surrender equals receptivity. So we have a desire that we put out in the world. You know, I want a new car. How that might show up or what the way it shows up often might even be better than we even thought was possible. So this idea of being able to stay open and receptive will serve you well. This concept of openness is so important. I remember a client that I had that wanted a certain amount of money for a project, and someone offered her more money than the figure she had in her head, so she turned it down. Then she was offered money by a family member, and she turned it down because she didn't want money from anybody that she knew directly or was a family member. And she actually turned down the funds that she needed three times. And I said to her, imagine that God has two requests. And one request is for money. God, hit me with whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want. Just help me here. And then there's a request from my client who says, I want so many dollars in small bills next Tuesday from a stranger on the corner of Broadway and Main Street. You have to consider that in that case, she is limiting her options. She's not open to what the co-creative partner might think is best or the manner in which the co-creative partner might think is the best way to pass the money on to her. So this concept of openness is that you are open without limitations or restrictions to receiving what you desire. The more limitations you put on it, the less open you are. And sometimes I use the word surrender here, but it's a personal preference. If you're more comfortable with openness, then openness is fine. But I also think of it in terms of surrendering, surrendering to the process. And sometimes there's a great delight in that because your eyes are really opened to what a co-creative partner can do. So the second element is your focus and sustained thought. And this is your contract or this is your request that you are making. And the beauty of the contract or the request is that it funnels creative energy into form. It takes the fuel of desire and funnels it into the form of what it is that you want. It's really good to know where you're going because it will help you to find the path. 
So that idea of staying focused, having your attention on what you want, will really help you in the manifestation process. I think that's a great image. And then you can think of your co-creative partner as GPS. You know where you want to go, and the co-creative partner is kind of guiding you through the process. The third element is flow. And this is, as I've said before, attraction and manifestation weather. It's information that comes to you from your co-creative partner. It's feedback. And flow can create increased ease in your life. Flow makes it so much easier to attract and receive. It's a time when things can just be going your way, when you're going with the flow. It can also be a time of frustration or setbacks when you're going against the flow, when you're in the state of I want what I want when I want it, despite obstacles or signs to the contrary. It also can be a time of change, of movement, shifting gears, and even breakdowns, particularly if there's a major transition that is going on. Its simple requests may just flow easily, but if there's something major that you're trying to change in your life, it's a major transition, it can produce some anxiety. And in this case, the flow might seem overwhelming. There may be signals around the process as things are changing and as you're letting go of the old and walking into the new, some things may break down because they're not supported by the new level of energy that you're moving to. And so there can be some tension or intensity as you get closer to the process of manifestation. And what you need to do in this situation is hold your desire and at the same time remain open. Stay in that dynamic tension. Because what happens is when you hold that polarity, then manifestation occurs and also there is a rise in consciousness. And it's almost like a universal law that this will occur. And an example that you can remember would be about relationships. When a man and a woman come together, they're very different in a relationship. And they approach the relationship in a different way. And when they come together and the relationship starts to grow, the relationship grows in love. Consciousness is being raised. But also, as they come together sexually, the possibility of manifestation occurs, that a child can be born. And so this is an example of holding a dynamic tension and having consciousness be raised and also manifestation occur. We've got desire and and attraction balanced by openness and receptivity. And we have your focus and sustained thought. And then we have the flow, and then we have the fourth principle, which is the avenue of manifestation, the means by which manifestation occurs and may or may not require action on your part. So this is how it's all going to show up eventually. This can be very exciting because it may be something very different than how you thought something might show up or maybe, you know, exactly how you thought it would show up. It may or may not take action on your part, but there's probably some kind of action, and that action might be surrendering to the process and trusting that the process is working. Very often, there are actions that we can take that will really energize and activate the process and get it moving. I think it's important to note, too, that the first two steps here, they're your steps. You have to state what your desire is, and you have to translate it into your focus, sustained thought, or request. But an understanding of flow comes from the co-creative partner. And also, in regards to the avenue of manifestation, the co-creative partner lets you know whether or not the ball's in your court or the ball's in God's court. You know, do you need to take an action or do you need to wait? So three and four, that's where it's very important to be in touch with your co-creative partner. 
what we're going to do now is talk about different experiences, different ways, and give different examples in regards to communication. Because what we want to do is sensitize you to all the different possibilities, or at least some of the ones that we can enumerate. There's always surprises to make you more aware of co-creative communication. We want you to understand the many ways in which you can receive communication and then how important it is to trust what you're receiving, to be able to interpret it and trust it. Trust is a big one. Trust is a big one for me personally. That was a process that really took a long time for me to fully embody that, and even now, there can be bells that go off. If you grew up in any kind of an environment that was challenging for whatever reason it might have been, you may not be an innate truster. You know, you may not have learned to trust as a child. Now we're asking you to trust something you can't necessarily see and to trust a process for something you really want and trust a being or an energy in the invisible that you're communicating with. So I just like to bring this up, that this was not easy for me. And over time, I have learned to trust and to appreciate the trust. So my support of you would be to not worry that you may not trust this process entirely right off the bat. But you can stick with it and work with it, and that trust becomes part of your spiritual growth. Good point. And also, I think in the beginning of this process, the co-creative partner, whoever that being might be, works hard to earn your trust. In the early stages, there's times when there is this sense of protection that really comes through that I think is very helpful. There's experiences that demonstrate that you are being watched over and protected. And I think that that's sweet. That is part of the experience of the co-creative partner is that there is this nurturing, protective quality that starts to come through with more and more communication and experience. One of the ways in which you might experience communication with the co-creative partner has to do with symbols. It can be a symbol that everybody recognizes, such as the heart for love or smiley emoticons or skull and crossbones, that type of thing. It can be a universal symbol that has a meaning, or it may have several meanings, but it's something that is recognizable. But it's also possible to have personal symbols. If you're just starting out, you can actually indicate a symbol that has a particular meaning for you. Lucky has mentioned the 7-Eleven is very important for her when she sees that because her, her name, Lucky. There can be symbols that have a personal meaning, or you can also state that there is a personal meaning around a particular symbol and that you want to have that as some type of indication of importance. And this might be Native American in regards to the medicine wheel cards or animal speaks, things that you see in nature. One of the things that is a personal symbol for me is the deer. I don't see them that frequently, but when I do, I immediately go back to what am I thinking? Was my thinking loving? Was it compassionate? Was it gentle? Was it tender? You can have certain symbols come forward, but you can also state in the beginning that this particular symbol has significance to me. Another way that communication can appear is through signs. A sign is a communication arising from an unexpected source that directly speaks to what is going on at the time or what your major concern is. There's not a standardized or personal symbol per se, but something more free form, immediate, and meaningful. This can be like you're trying to manifest and you just see the word show up somewhere. For me, it's very often something Irish going by 
because as Lucky Sweeney, I kind of identify with that and identify with that spirituality and energy of the Irish. I'll be somewhere and have something on my mind and turn around and the Irish Electric Company truck will go by or I'll see a shamrock or a four-leaf clover or something like that somewhere. And it, it just comes forward. I've also been studying various things or trying to understand a concept. And then we'll find that word, the word that I need to illuminate, you know, pop out maybe from somebody else's conversation or maybe I see it in another book entirely and it just seems to jump off the page. Those are some of the way, signs that I see. I think that you've done a good job of demonstrating how free form it can be. And that's the interesting thing about signs is that it's not like a symbol that is something that's reoccurring or has a definite meaning. Uh, it can occur in so many different ways. So another way is coincidence or synchronicity. Coincidence occurs when two events are connected by timing one occurring immediately after the other or linked in some other way. You may be thinking about a problem or issue and immediately see a billboard that speaks to the problem or issue. Or you might jump in your car, turn on the radio, and the first song lyrics you hear might speak to you. In coincidence, events are generally connected by timing, though there can be other forms of connection. Synchronicity is a term that Carl Jung made really popular in usage, I think. His idea was that two things that are happening at the same time arise from the same moment and have some relationship to each other and that they are synergistic. They somehow relate. This is one of my favorite ones, the turning on the radio or making a turn and running into somebody I hadn't seen in years or something like that. This is one of my favorite, just because I feel like it's the universe waving at me. You know, sometimes it's not a big deal. So it's not like a thunderbolt moment. Oh, yes, this is the answer to everything. But for some reason, it has that feeling of, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this is happening. Just past that is the understanding that the universe is just waving. Hi, here we are. Everything's going to be okay, and you're connected. I agree with you about the radio, hearing the song lyrics. It's not like I get in my car and I listen for the lyrics that first come on. My awareness changes when there's going to be an important message. In other words, it breaks through my turning on the car, driving out of the garage, that type of thing, that all of a sudden, oh, my God, listen to what was just said on the radio. And it can be months in between. But still, it calls my attention at particular times. And I think these coincidences, the synchronicity, also calls your attention, which is very interesting. Another way, and this is one of my favorites, my all-time favorites, is ease. Ease in regards to things just occurring. They, the doors fly open. Opportunities arise unexpectedly. And suddenly your way is made clear. You get exactly what you need, when you need it, how you need it, all of that. And this encourages you to move ahead quickly. And it's important to take advantage of that situation. Many times there's a reason why you're given the green light and everything is like cleared away in your path so that you can move forward. I remember at one point my Cherokee medicine woman friend was giving a field trip kind of conference out in Arizona with her teacher. And she asked me to come be the person that drove the car, just have to buy your own food and your plane ticket. And at the time, I didn't have the money for the plane ticket. So I said, if I'm meant to go, the plane ticket will appear because I don't have the money for the plane ticket right now. And she called me back three hours later. She opened her American Express bill, and there was a coupon for a companion ticket, that if you bought a ticket for anywhere and the companion flew with you, the companion ticket was free. And so, like, within three hours, I had a ticket to Arizona, and it was a very eventful trip. 
And so you can have ease where doors just open. So this is one of the fun ones, God whispers. God whispers can be actual whispers that you hear or input from the thought voice, you know, having a certain thought come across your mind. And these are always fun. This is this may not be a part of your particular style. And this one has come to me in the, in the last decade. Is just took a while. Again, the trust issue, I bring that up. It took me a while to really take it seriously that I was actually hearing a message or an idea, something that I should pay attention to because I would discount it. I would just think, oh, I'm just thinking in my head, you know, that's mine. There's just an idea. I encourage folks that I work with to not discount those things because it very well is a message and a communication. And, again, to say that there's this skill of learning to be able to trust and also to really feel within yourself that this is important. I think one of the really first things that you see is if something feels like it's important, it probably is. And we can have a tendency to say, oh, I'm just making that up. But I'd encourage you, if it feels important, at least give it a really good look to see what might be there, taking it in and receiving. I want to talk a little bit about difficulty in closed doors. This is the opposite of ease. This is where doors slam in your face or you make no headway or you have setbacks. Everything that you try fails and fails repeatedly, and you're not getting any assistance. At that point, you have to ask yourself whether or not you're moving in the right direction. Are you being ego-driven, or do you need to sit down and talk with your co-creative partner, check in, and see what's going on? I have an agreement with my co-creative partner that I only bang my head against the wall three times. If I'm trying something and three times it fails, and it fails miserably, so to speak, that I'm going to sit down, meditate, and we'll have a talk. Maybe I'm going about it the wrong way, or maybe I need to make an adjustment, or maybe I need to wait, but I need to be clear on what is going on in regards to this difficulty that I'm having. An example of a difficulty that I had was, this was back maybe 20 years ago, it seemed that everybody had a master or a guru, and I wanted to find my master or guru. One of the places I went was to the Sri Chamoy Center in D.C., and it was in a house that had combined two row houses, and so there were pillars in the room where the supporting wall had been. After the course was over, at some point they showed a video of Sri Chamoy Chorus. And my cousin is in the chorus at the UN. And so I shifted in order to see my cousin on the video. And then we were instructed to meditate. After meditation, they put a picture of Sri Chamoy up on the altar. And at some point we were told to open our eyes and stare at the picture and we would know whether Sri Chamoy was our guru or not. Well, when I opened my eyes, the pillar was in my way. I couldn't even see the picture at all. Obviously, Sri Chamoy was not my guru. In regards to God Whispers, about six months later, I was reading a New Age newspaper. It mentioned a female llama that was in Poolsville, Maryland, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe this is my guru, at which point the thought voice totally broke in and actually surprised me. You know, sometimes there's an element of surprise in in regards to the God Whisper, and said, you will call no man nor woman master in this lifetime. And I was so surprised, I actually thought, who thought that? Because it didn't seem like I had thought it at all. So let's talk a little bit about dreams, particularly lucid dreams. Lucid dreams are very vivid and tend to have great significance. Normally, you are part of the dream and may even interact with the dream directing action, making decisions, or requesting information. Now, this is not particularly a skill that I have. 
I have friends who are quite good dreamers, and I've heard many stories of lucid dreaming, the ability to actually take action in your dream, even when you're asleep. I am also not a good dreamer. It's very rare that I remember a dream. For me to remember them is unusual. One that I do remember as being very significant was I had a stone on my side yard that I meditated on. It was wide at one end and pointed on the other and had a perfect slope for meditation. At one point, I decided to put a medicine wheel garden in the back of the house. And that stone was going to be my creator stone, the one that would be in the middle. In my mind, it would be straight up and down in the center. It would be on end. But this one dream, I saw the stone fall over. I saw it in the garden. I saw it fall over. And I saw it turn. And it pointed directly at my office and the window that I sat at to work on the computer. I realized that every medicine wheel is connected to every other medicine wheel on the earth. Therefore, it's a real power grid from one medicine wheel to the other. And by having that creator stone pointing directly at me was funneling energy to me. It's a very significant dream. When it came time to move the stone, fortunately, I had that vision. Otherwise, I don't think I would have gotten it moved. I just knew that it was going to make it to the backyard one way or the other. And it was difficult to do, but I kept at it, and eventually it was put in place. So, Visions are another way of receiving guidance and information from your co-creative partner. Visions are dreams when you are awake and can occur with your eyes open or closed. So some people actually have visions, see energies or symbols or beings with their eyes open appearing before them. More common vision for me is with my eyes closed and in various kinds of situations from just asking a question and getting a a picture or I could be listening to a piece of music or particularly in meditation this is possible. This is another way that we receive information. Visions may occur out of the corner of your eye, and sometimes you'll look to the side, and of course it's gone. But it still can be valid. They don't necessarily occur directly before you. This is not something that I have a lot of experience in. However, I did have one that had no meaning. And I think it's important to point out that no matter how stark an experience is, you still have to interpret it. And it may or may not have meaning. At some point, it is possible that something occurs that you really just can't relate to or understand. In that case, you can just ask, I'm going to need more information. You need to tell me more because I'm not getting the message Any of these experiences may or may not have meaning. An important point to remember, no matter how stark it is, that doesn't automatically mean that it has meaning or that it's important. Energetic sensations. This is a vibration or electrical sensation that you can feel with your physical body or perceive in other ways. You may be able to feel it outside of your body. It may not have any definition, meaning, or purpose that you understand or recognize at the time. And sometimes it can remain a mystery. But I think what goes on is that this is a communication that is nonverbal. As it passes through your body, it may have a particular purpose. It may have something to do with cleansing or sensitizing or healing. It can occur in a number of different ways. Years ago, I used to have these posters that were Buddhist mandalas, and I knew that there were secrets in those posters. This is just, you know, a regular $20 poster on the wall. I would sit there and I would try to figure out what the meaning was. How many were there of this curly cue or that color or this symbol? I was trying to understand them. 
And then one day, while I was sitting there, this energy bolt just came out of the mandala and just hit me between the eyes. And it was like, oh, it's like I got it at that moment that it wasn't about analyzing this mandala. It was about being in meditation and just being in front of that poster, that mandala, and just being with it and letting the energy come in and go through me. I didn't know exactly what the energy was doing, but I did grow spiritually. And sometimes I think that the energy would come in and it was my job to translate it, to put it into words. And there were times when I would be two, three weeks later, maybe a month later or more, grappling with a concept that I was trying to understand and put into words. And I usually thought it came from that energetic impulse, that there was some type of gestation that was going on. And this was something that I needed to understand and translate as best I could and put it into words so maybe other people could understand it or I could understand it. I would say this is probably, for me, the most developed of the message-receiving capacities. Over the years, it's become very sensitive to various kinds of energy around me, within me, that comes from hypervigilance that I developed as a child because of certain circumstances where I was just very aware of what was going on in my environment. It took me a while before I really understood as I matured and became an adult that I would walk into a room and have some sense of what was happening there. And I could have some sense of what people were feeling and who was happy there and who wasn't. My first tendency was to discount that. But over the years, I began to realize this was a way that I was communicating and receiving communication from a higher power. It was a way of knowing, is this a place that feels comfortable? Is this a place that doesn't feel comfortable? Is this a place where I could serve? That sensitivity of, of places that I want to get out of, that I don't want to be there anymore. It just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like it, this is the place for me. And then there are many other kind of variations on that theme, but it's one of the big ones for me. Other formats. This is a catch-all, free-form category of uh, the other weird and wonderful things that can go on. When I was in graduate school, I read a book by R.D. Lang, that's L-A-I-N-G, called The Politics of Experience. And basically what Lang was saying was, there's no difference between the experience of the mystic and the experience of the schizophrenic, except that the mystic comes back. They come back to reality. So the experiences may be very strange, but the mystic will come back and function in society. So if I could come back and change diapers, wash dishes, run carpool, cook dinner, I would let my experiences be what they were. I wouldn't try to explain them away. And one of the weirdest things I had was what I call the Ballad of Mildred. I had a computer, a 386, that the motherboard went down on, and it was very arduous getting the computer back up. And after a month, when the computer came back and finally booted up, I was so happy, I bent over and I kissed the screen, and I said, I love you, honey. And the thought voice said, my name's not honey, my name is Mildred. And I went, Mildred? They said, yes, it has special meaning. Look it up in the dictionary. And I said, they don't put proper names in the dictionary. And Mildred said, well, this one's there. Look it up. And I looked it up, and it meant gentle power and strength. It was in the dictionary. And so Mildred and I started this relationship, a relationship with a conscious computer, where Mildred would refuse to print out things in programs that I had run for 10 years until I had meditated on what the client would want. I would put things into the computer and everybody else around them would come out, but the one person I was trying to get out would not. And then once I meditated, the computer would write itself. Without rebooting, 
when I was on target, Mildred would do what she needed to do. It was somewhat frustrating at times, but I got used to it. But then Mildred started to yodel, and it drove me nuts. And so I opened Mildred up, and I took the wire off the speaker so she couldn't yodel. Shortly thereafter, I was writing about manifestation and attraction. And I must have been totally left brain and not listening to my co-creative partner because after three hours, then the electricity went out and I lost everything. We didn't have automatic save back then. And I went and meditated, realized where I was wrong. It was so upsetting for me that I was crying in front of the computer. And I said, you can't do this to me. You've got to give me some warning. Don't let me go for three hours and then tell me that I'm off base. You've got to give me some warning. And the thought voice said, well, you turn the yodel off. So whenever my energy was off, my writing was off, Mildred would yodel. And so for the following year, every time she would start yodeling, I would hit the backspace until she would stop. And then I would go meditate. And when I came back, we would start again. So that's my weird, irrational story. And one of the things that I took from Carl Jung is that he had a lot of very unusual experiences. But in the process, what he did was he really cultivated imagination. He let his imagination loose in this process of spiritual development. And this is where Jungian psychology came from. Imagination is a good thing. It's part of the communication with a co-creative partner. The thing is to be somewhat aware of what the message is. And so we're going to talk about the nature of communications. So it's important to distinguish your experiences from the unconscious debris, fears, expectations, and personal agendas to evaluate your experiences for the quality of the message and interchange. What is the nature of the experience? Is it a sign, a symbol, a feeling, etc.? And what is the quality of the experience? Is it positive or negative in characteristic? This is getting into the fine-tuning process of, and know that this can take time. Get attuned to how you receive messages and how you hear messages, and, and that's fine. There's no hurry. Also, your way is going to be unique to you. Absolutely. I think that's important to, to recognize that this process of communication can be very unique from one person to the other, as much as the process of manifestation is unique each time, too. What are the characteristics of positive communication? Certainly, it is loving, protective, and spiritually uplifting. It's supportive. It's encouraging you in the process of what it is that you're trying to do. It can be humorous, too. And in this part about imagining, one of the things I did at one point was I told the inner teacher that I wanted to learn about my ego and when I was being egotistical. And the humorous part was what my inner teacher did, or my co-creative partner at that time, was it, there would be a flag on the play. It's like in a football game when they're offsides or whatever they're doing, and the referee throws a flag, and that lets everybody know there's a flag on the play, and then they decide if there's a penalty or whatever. So I would be in a situation, and I would see a flag on the play. And I would know that there was an egotistical moment at that point. And when I was alone, I would say to the inner teacher, run the replay. And they would run the replay from where the flag went and show me where I was being egotistical. And so it was a humorous way to handle it. It made it easier for me to accept where I was off base and to see that and forgive myself, learn, and move on. Communications also convey wisdom. They're insightful. They satisfy the rule of three, and this is something that's very important for me in regards to where I'm going spiritually. The interesting thing of the rule of three, looking for my guru and master, 
was that there was a lecture given in the Shamala Center on how to find your guru and master in this lifetime. And I went to the lecture specifically saying, oh, they're going to tell me how to do this. When I got in the room, they said that lecture had been canceled. There was going to be a new lecture, and you'd have to wait to the next lifetime in order to find your guru and master. And I just broke out laughing. It was so clear. And that was the third time in this process of trying to find a guru and master. And I just gave it up completely at that point. So the rule of three is very important to me. Meaningful. It has some type of meaning that it's addressing what it is that you're working on or what it is that you need to know. If your contract is very involved, it might be an indication of a milestone of success. This is a step in the right direction. Also, it can be involved with coincidental timing. There's something about the communication that is so immediate that it really calls your attention. And here are some negative characteristics that you want to look out for and be conscious if you're feeling these negative characteristics. It's controlling that you feel some element of control from the communication. This is a freeing process. That it's about others because that's not really what this is about. It's about you. Off the mark, it flatters your ego or fear-based, makes you feel afraid. Or predictive, so we're making this distinction between prediction and guidance. Guidance gives you a direction or sensing of where to go, but doesn't predict outcome. Condones your anger, is critical of you in any way. So these are all negative characteristics. The flatters your ego one is really interesting because your co-creative partner is trying to get you beyond the ego. That's a definite no-no. And the condones your anger. God is not into smiting your enemies. There's not going to be any confirmation or uh, condoning of your anger by any means. Communications can also be irrational at times. When you step into the miraculous realm, things are irrational. In many traditions, the holies of holies is irrational, that things don't make sense, that they don't work on what we would consider normal causality in the way things happen. Sometimes the experiences can be irrational. They can also be ineffable, meaning that you can't put it into words, like the energetic things that can go on or the sensing that Lucky was talking about in regards to meeting people or being in a room. Maybe you can't put it into words, but there's still something that you know that is going on. Sometimes it can be challenging, and challenging in the sense that you are challenged to be more loving, more compassionate, more understanding, or going beyond your comfort zone is another challenge that sometimes can occur. Some other consideration, what communications are like. What is the message being conveyed in its pure form? This is where we get to develop insight for ourselves. What is the meaning of the message, your interpretation and application of the message? How important is the message, weighing it in regard to your situation or your next step? And is your interpretation valid, confirmation upon application? This is a really interesting one. All of these are really interesting, and you begin to get into the subtler levels of these processes. But for instance, a confirmation upon application, I was thinking the other day I got a message to go to a certain place, and I went. I have learned to just do that if it's a convenient thing to do. You will learn that there are dimensions. You'll learn to know within yourself when something is very, very powerful and must be attended to right this moment versus things that maybe don't need to be attended to right this moment, some things that maybe aren't totally clear what the message is about. This is the other piece in all of this is we don't always know what that side trip was about. You may have just energetically moved through that neighborhood or down that street. Somehow your open heart was able to help somebody out or 
to assist in serve in some way. I don't feel any of those are kind of lost opportunities, but occasionally you don't know exactly why. Particularly in the manifestation process, I think our messages become, really do carry these meaning qualities as we've listed here. Um, what's the message? What is it, you know, what is it telling me? And that that also is like everything else, a practice, practice, practice thing. And you will learn to um, develop these qualities if they aren't innate. You know, some of you may be able to do it right off the bat. There are many fine points and subtleties in nature manifesting through attraction and receptivity, and these cannot be taught directly. Only experienced first and then recognized in hindsight. There's this master that takes his students out into the night air, and he points to the moon. He's teaching his students to go beyond, and then when he turns and looks at them, he realizes that they're looking at his finger. They're not looking at the moon. One of the things you need to realize is that in regards to what we're teaching, we're taking you as far as we can, but you need to go beyond. The co-creative partner is your true teacher, your mentor, your guide, your assistant. And this is why communication is so important, is that the co-creative partner takes you beyond the experiences within the co-creative partnership fill in this gap in regards to manifestation. Every request, every event, every process of manifestation is different. And also, you're different. You're unique. And so your co-creative partner is going to come up with a plan that is custom-made for you, that fits you for where you are, how you're moving, what your concerns are, all of that, the co-creative partner is the person that takes you beyond. One of the things you may discover is that there are periods where there's a lack of trust, and this is probably when you're going beyond your comfort zone. And this may occur a number of times along the way, depending upon when things are speeding up or accelerating. Trust becomes an issue and also resistance can be an issue where you're resistant to taking action. I was looking for a hotai, and this is a picture of the hotai that I eventually got. And I'd been looking for a hotai for about a year. One day I was driving through Ellicott City in Maryland, and the thought voice broke in with, there's a hotai at the Antique Depot. And I immediately responded, they don't have hotais at the Antique Depot. I was very resistant, and the voice said again, there's a hotai at the Antique Depot. And I responded again, they are all kiosks there, and they're all antiques. There are no Asian kiosks there, and there's no hotai at the Antique Depot. At which point the voice one more time said, there's a hotai at the Antique Depot. Now, this is three times. So, rule of three, I pulled off, had to find a parking space, and went into the Antique Depot, went through four floors of kiosks, and the second to the last kiosk had this hotai. And at the time, I didn't have the money for it, and so I left it there, even though I loved it. I thought it was beautiful. But the next day, I had a friend come and visit for a couple of weeks because we were going to some Buddhist empowerments over in West Virginia, and she was staying with me. And she said, I'd really like to get you something. Is there something special that you would like? And I said, yes, there's a hotai at the Antique Depot. And so she purchased this for me. But you can see how resistant I was. I didn't trust. It's such a bother to find a parking spot in Ellicott City. It's important to move beyond that. So what manifestation can feel like? Sometimes it's extreme ease and surprising turns of events, exciting and wonderful. Sometimes it's high energy chaos and tension and stress as you balance desire with openness to manifestation, however it occurs. Confusion regarding communication or little input during the process. Difficult to trust and resistance to action. 
So any of those phenomena are possible. Another characteristic that can underlie any of these is there may be circumstances in your life or in your personality that are actually getting moved in order for the manifestation to happen. And that can cause tension or a feeling of chaos. You're personally breaking through, and this is where the spiritual dimension, right, of the process, that in order for you to move to the next level, maybe there's some quality of yourself or some condition um, in your life that needs to move that can also be a factor in this process of what it looks like. And not to worry about it. Just trust, keep on going forward. If it's your true desire, it will be revealed what your steps are, even when it feels really uncomfortable. The easy ones are when it's easy breezy. That's not hard to take, but it isn't always that way. Is it, Mary? No, very good point, Lucky. It's not just about what you desire. It's also about you and the changes that are going on in you. And sometimes they're Mm -hmm. big changes. Good point. The next and final lesson in this course is Troubleshooting Manifestation. This lesson on Troubleshooting Manifestation is to help you through the process of manifestation when there seems to be issues. We will talk about communication and connection as the first thing that you look at in regards to troubleshooting manifestation. Next, we will look at the balance of desire and openness and how to sustain your focused thought. There can be a variety of problems with the avenue of manifestation and we will discuss them. The flow can be too fast or too slow. Maybe you're moving against the flow, and sometimes the flow seems to be non-existent. We will also talk about health and business contracts. Mary and I are both available for individual private sessions for any of you who might be feeling a little stuck with your contract or not sure exactly where to go or in the process of writing it. So we are available for private coaching and would support you in your process. We look forward to speaking with you next week. This has been a wonderful experience for me doing this course with Lucky, but also being able to convey this information to you students. I'm really glad that you signed up for the course, and I look forward to helping you in any way we can next week. I feel the same way. It's been great fun, and I wish everybody the best of luck with their contract for their continuing experience in manifestation. The information in this course is based on the book Heart Journey written by Mary Shea under the spiritual pen name Mary Juno. The book is divided into three parts. Part one, the initiation, is about writing your Sacred Heart contract. Part two, the co-creative partnership and manifestation process, gives you communication techniques and also troubleshooting tips for the manifestation process. Part three, spiritual development and heart openings, lists 12 co-creative thought transformations that will increase your ability to attract and eight stages of heart openness. The more your heart is open, the greater your ability to receive abundance. The book is available at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and your local bookstore. Also available in digital format everywhere for the iPad, tablet, iPhone, Android phone, Kindle, Nook, and computer. There are free apps available for all formats.